Brilliant. Uh, so I think uh, we've got all the participants uh, ready, so we'll kick off. Um, so yes, thank you for joining today. Um, so I'm uh, Edward, Employer Engagement Lead at the Social Mobility Commission, uh, and welcome to the SMC's Masterclass series of webinars uh, for employers. So today's session, we were uh, focusing on progression and the role employers can play in strengthening social mobility through equitable progression practices. Uh, so just a bit of housekeeping before we start. Um, so if you do have any questions, uh, please pop them in the questions box throughout the presentations. Uh, and we will endeavor to answer your questions at the Q&A session at the end. Um, so this webinar is recorded and you will be able to uh, watch on YouTube channel afterwards and share uh, the presentation link with your colleagues. Um, so the slides have also been uh, uh, posted in the chat box. So if you wish to access them, please click on the link. So if we just uh, move on to the first side. Um, so today we'll be exploring the role of progression in organizations strategies aimed at supporting social mobility uh, and how organizations can create uh, strategies for supporting their employees to learn new skills and uh, reach the next stage in their uh, careers, regardless of their backgrounds. So I'll be considering some, uh, some of the actions employers can take to uh, support all staff to access opportunities for, to develop um, and look at the beneficial role that training and uh, supporting employees to learn and develop new skills can have on a workforce. So it, it, it can be difficult for employees to know exactly uh, where to start when addressing barriers to progression. Um, so I'm pleased uh, to be joined today by uh, Donna Catley, the Chief People Officer at Compass Group UK, uh, and Charlotte Shiwa, uh, Social Mobility Lead at the Department for Work and Pensions. So uh, they'll both be sharing their experiences of how uh, clear and accessible progression routes can, uh, can support employees to progress. Um, so they're going to be highlighting some of the actions that uh, organizations have taken, and we'll be giving practical examples of how they have created clear pathways uh, for their employees. If we just move on to the next slide, so what is social mobility? So social mobility is about uh, ensuring that a person's occupation and income is not tied to where they started in life and ensuring that uh, people of all backgrounds have equal opportunities. So it's about ensuring that your socioeconomic background doesn't determine your outcomes in life. Uh, so put simply, it's about fairness and uh, ensuring that everyone has the chance to succeed uh, regardless of what their parents did or where in the country they grew up or any other uh, social characteristic. So broadly speaking, there are two types of social mobility. So relative social mobility, uh, so that's about uh, ensuring that people have the opportunity through hard work and talent to uh, improve their own personal situation compared to that of their parents and uh, absolute social mobility. So that's ensuring that overall each generation has better living standards than the, than the next. The actions uh, we'll be exploring today will consider how employers can take uh, steps in supporting socioeconomic inclusion with your own organisations and uh, social mobility generally. If we have a look at the next slide, so as we're discussing uh, progression today, just a, a, a quick word that many uh, organizations incorrectly see hiring a diverse workforce as an end goal of their inclusion strategies. In fact, uh, but progression is often one of the last areas employers consider. So while it is important to uh, make sure that employment opportunities are open to individuals from all backgrounds, it's equally crucial that once on board, all employers have equal access to opportunities to progression. So social mobility isn't just about who gets in, it is about who gets on as well. 
ensuring that once uh, employees get into your organization, uh, your organization's practices are preventing, preventing them from getting on. So uh, developing a clear progression strategy and uh, communicating it to your employees can help uh, build engaged, uh, inclusive and productive teams that can add uh, value to your organization. So I'll talk through some of the points uh, on the slide you can see uh, of the research that we have done over the years, uh, on, which focus on both uh, progression from both uh, low paid and low skilled uh, roles, as well as progression in high skilled professional occupations. So as you can see on the slide, uh, research does show that uh, those who take up uh, employer funded training are more likely to be from more privileged backgrounds. Uh, and this suggests that employees um, are upskilling those who are already skilled workers. And this does suggest that uh, there is a gap in provision of training options for those low skilled workers. So this also links into uh, other research on progression, which shows that uh, many organizations still tilt their norms uh, towards those from more privileged backgrounds, which can affect in individuals progression within organizations. The research also shows that uh, individual confidence is also an issue with uh, individuals often lacking uh, confidence in their ability to progress and have uh, low expectations of employers to provide training and uh, access to progression. So if we have a look at the, uh, the next slide, we'll take a closer look at uh, uh, our, one of our research uh, pieces, uh, looking at progression uh, for frontline workers. So our uh, increasing in-work training and progression uh, for frontline workers report, uh, it took a uh, closer look at progression in three industries, the so retail, uh, industrial and the hospitality sectors where upward mobility of low skilled workers was particularly poor. The study uh, delved into the barriers that exist uh, to progression and the interventions organizations can make uh, to offer better prospects to their staff. The report contains uh, research case studies and actions for employers. So the purpose of the, the research was to identify behavioral insights which could uh, uh, have an impact and consider how uh, the uptake of training and career progression uh, could be given to frontline workers. So it considered uh, what drives uh, employees to offer training and also what, uh, what prevented this to understand uh, how to overcome uh, these factors. The research found that uh, organizations with strong uh, progression cultures do benefit from increased productivity, uh, higher quality outputs, lower staff turnover, and being seen as uh, a more attractive workplace. However, uh, despite these benefits, uh, progression from the front line within these sectors is low uh, and offering training to uh, frontline workers is also less common. So if we just take a look at some of the key findings from the report, uh, so while some of these findings are more specific to the sectors uh, that it looked into, uh, they do have relevance to uh, different industries and sectors and organizations, uh, which we hope all employers can, can reflect upon. So the, the most significant barrier to uh, social mobility uh, was that social mobility was rarely reported to be a uh, priority for organizations. So it was generally uh, low engagement with the concept of social mobility and uh, few leaders saw it as a, a priority or within their remit. So organizations commonly did not see it as a, the business case uh, to make the investment uh, worthwhile uh, and lack sight of the potential benefits that considering uh, social mobility could have. But the, the, the research always, uh, also found that uh, these are fast paced sectors um, that are often customer and profit focused. And there was a tendency to view uh, frontline staff as replaceable, uh, therefore uh, not worth investing in progression. 
So some organizations did not prioritize uh, investing in staff development at the frontline level. Uh, consequently, frontline roles were reported uh, to have higher turnover rates. So frontline staff in these sectors also tended not to see their jobs as careers. So they, they had uh, low expectations of the sectors to provide training and access to progression, uh, particularly uh, where it was seen there was a lack of meaningful opportunities to progress. So another, another key finding was that organizations did, did not work with staff to develop opportunities that were appealing or uh, in an appropriate format. So uh, training opportunities were more commonly offered to higher skilled uh, office-based staff, uh, and some organizations applied the same format uh, to training uh, frontline workers without consulting on what topics to include or, or what format to set the training in. Another key finding was that the channels to communicate uh, training and progression opportunities uh, for staff were not always effective. So the organizations lacked uh, regular uh, management meetings, giving uh, particularly line management meetings, uh, giving staff little opportunity to discuss uh, their training needs or career aspirations. So overall, uh, the organizations tended to have uh, short-term fo focuses uh, so this hindered the investment in long-term gains, uh, uh, such as uh, training, staff training, uh, to re retain them, and also uh, prevented them from realising any of the benefits that this uh, could have. If we just look at the next slide, which looks at uh, uh, the four key steps uh, that the report identified that organisations sh should take to um, support in-work training and uh, career guidance. The, the, the first key step was uh, buy-in for strategic leaders. So it found that uh, buy-in for strategic leaders is essential uh, to develop and embed an effective progression culture. So uh, in organizations with strong uh, progression cultures, strategic leaders had uh, chosen to prioritize uh, staff development at all levels. Uh, including the front line to, uh, and this helped increase uh, staff's satisfaction and retention. The leaders tended to see, uh, see it as an important part of the company brand and uh, reputation, um, and they also linked it to the quality of their service delivery. So another key uh, step that organisations should take is re uh, reviewing uh, company structures and the ways of working to enable access to um, meaningful career uh, progression opportunities at all levels within organizations. So organizations that saw the, the benefit um, uh, from retaining long serving staff uh, over having higher turnover had uh, better outputs. Um, so for example, uh, providing uh, you could provide structured support for staff uh, to participate in training and progression in uh, frontline roles, uh, which uh, met their needs and aspirations. Another uh, key point was uh, creating an environment where, where, where it is the norm for uh, frontline staff to expect uh, training and career conversations with their managers. So one of the key things is uh, regular team and line management meetings because uh, uh, they present the best environment to communicate uh, training and progression opportunities to all staff. Uh, and finally, uh, a, key, uh, a key point is uh, embedding uh, measures throughout uh, the businesses uh, that prioritise and support individuals to progress at their own pace. Uh, so, for example, uh, ring fence training budget to ensure uh, you can offer development opportunities to staff at all levels uh, to get uh, together with dedicated uh, internal uh, learning and development roles to ensure uh, accountability to the commitment of uh, staff progression. So that was uh, just some of the, the, the research and actions that we recommend uh, employers should take uh, when considering uh, progression within your uh, organizations. 
So as I said, we've got uh, guest speakers on today, which really uh, we wanted to bring an employer's uh, voice into this. Uh, so we'll now hand over uh, to Donna Catley, who's the Chief uh, People Officer at Compass Group UK. Um, so she will share how Compass has created uh, clear pathways uh, for frontline employees, helping them understand uh, the profession routes and opportunities uh, to upskill and reskill uh, in their uh, Compass careers. So I'll now hand over to Donna. Thank you, Edward. Thanks very much. I wasn't sure there whether to be slightly depressed by your first slide or slightly excited by your second slide, which showed some of the solutions. Um, first of all, let me just say a couple of words about Compass Group, because some of you may not be aware of who we are. Uh, we are a retail and hospitality industry. Um, we're part of the FTSE 30. We're an international organization about um, 500,000 people work for us across the globe. In the United Kingdom, we are the people that will actually serve almost all corners of the lives that you and your families um, live today. We uh, serve uh, food and deliver services in hospitals, in schools, at universities. We do the same at workplaces across the country. That can be anything from factories such as Jaguar Land Rover through to almost all of the offices that we see in, the, in Canary Wharf. And then finally, when you're out and about at the weekend, we also run the hospitality at um, prestigious events such as uh, Twickenham, Wimbledon, many of the Premier League football uh, uh, clubs. If sport's not your gig, then we run Glyndebourne. Um, we have a partnership with the National Theatre and many others. And our workers, the 50,000 people that work for us in the United Kingdom, um, are hugely varied in the types of jobs that they do and the types of backgrounds that they have. But the vast majority of the people that work for us would tend to be your classic frontline people, um, semi, semi skilled, semi educated. If we go on to the next slide, for us, we see ourselves as having a real mission in the people space. Uh, and our mission very, very simply, but not so easy to deliver, is as a company which is so big, as such a big employer, as a company which stretches through all corners of the United Kingdom, and as a company which is really barrierless in its entry, you don't have to have a PhD to come and work for us. We believe that these characteristics mean that we can be, frankly, a real driver for good. And we can help as a big employer to address the inequalities that create barriers for people to progress in our society. And as a result, we see ourselves as a driver of social mobility. And perhaps unlike many other organizations, that is the language that we use here. It is absolutely fundamental to the strategy that we have in our business. It's not just for us a responsibility to the 50,000 people. It's much more exciting than that. It's an opportunity and it's an opportunity to affect really positive change for the lives of our colleagues, for their families and the communities that we all operate in. And there are five runs to our strategy. The first is what we call the first rung. It's that precious first job. We can all think about our first job and what that meant for us. Somebody having confidence in us and giving us a first opportunity to build some skills. And that can be anything from being a cleaner or a barista or a kitchen porter. It can be joining our apprentice program or our graduate program. But for us, that's really critical. It is, to use Edward's phrase, the getting in piece. I'll skip for getting on for the moment and I'll move to the Compass Academy, which is a multi-million pound investment that we announced at the end of last year. We'll be building a learning and outreach centre in the West Midlands. It will be targeted at social mobility cold spots and we will reach in and through partnerships, build skills and experience in those areas. 
Nobody left behind are the partnerships we have with different charities, everything from the Prince's Trust to the Clink to support people um, that have come from particular disadvantage. And finally, as a big frontline employer, we have an important position on pay. We are, rec we are a recognized um, service provider of the real living wage, and we use our weight and our voice to influence clients around paying the real living wage. But the piece we're going to talk about today is getting on. How do you get into this business? There are lots of ways to get into a business like this, but it's the getting on that's really, really important if we're going to act as a driver for change. And if you go on to the next slide, what we would often hear people say when we ask them, and this is just talking to people, visiting sites, all the way through to the more formal pulse surveys um, and all employee surveys that we conduct. People would ask, how do I get on? How can I develop? Where do I go for support? What does it take to get a promotion? Where do I find another job? Is this a transparent process? And from us, the question is, now you're in, how can we support you to get on? And it's really that context, listening to our colleagues and thinking about our bigger strategic intent, that we started to observe that in our business, we actually had some amazing examples where people had progressed. We have fantastic stories of people starting as a cleaner and moving on to be trained to be a chef, which is what they'd always wanted to do or starting as a barista and moving on and becoming an operations manager and leading a region and a large team. But we also had stories where people felt trapped. They didn't feel like they understood how to develop their skills and their line manager wasn't always as supportive as we'd want them to be. And so what we could see in our big business was that there was frankly, a little bit of luck, too much luck in being able to progress here. And we wanted to take out the good luck, the bad luck element, and actually make the experience for our frontline colleagues a little bit more consistent so that wherever they are and wherever they sit, they understand what it takes to get on here. And that very simply, is what we call our Compass Career Pathways. And if you go on to the next slide, we developed these over the course of a year. We developed them as part of a huge engagement process with our frontline and with all levels up, including executive sponsors. And it was the very process of us developing our pathways that was part of the journey itself, because that enabled us to really listen to people, to really understand actually for ourselves, what are the skills and what are the experiences that somebody needs to progress their career here? And in this business, there's no reason why somebody couldn't start on that first rung and move every single step of the ladder up and become a member of the executive team. If you can't do it in a business like this, I don't know which business you could do it in. We, we can offer that opportunity. But not everybody wants that type of opportunity. And our career pathways talk about moving up which is moving towards a promotion, moving across, which is about gaining different skills and different jobs, and what we call being the master of your craft, which is very simply being absolutely brilliant at the trade that you have. But the important thing for us is that it's the choice of a colleague. It doesn't happen by happenstance. It doesn't happen because you have more advantage or not happen because you're more disadvantaged. It happens because it's your choice and you're making an informed choice. So our career pathways talk about moving up, moving across or mastering your craft. If you go on to the next slide, 
we identified what we call really simply our critical skill areas, or in other companies, they're called their really their key disciplines. And the central functions are, um, you know, all of the pretty obvious ones. We didn't start with the central functions because many functional areas already have a professional ladder and professional qualifications. We started with the front line, and that's really, really the heart of our career paths. We started by looking at the areas of culinary and cooking, hospitality and service, cleaning, portering, front of house, security. Sometimes in businesses, these are the jobs that get forgotten, but these are the jobs in our business. And we feel proud of the people that work for us. And we're proud of what they deliver every day for our customers. So our career paths started with jobs at the front line. And if you go to the next slide, what you start to see is what did we very simply, what did we do when we looked at those um, looked at those disciplines? I don't know if you're able to move to the next slide, but we could keep it on this one, actually, because this is quite a helpful one. This actually shows what a career path looks like in the culinary and cleaning area. And really, really simply, it actually, it took a lot of work, but it sounds simple. We took a look in this, in this instance in, in the culinary and cooking area, and we said, what are the five levels in our organization that somebody can step through if they start on the first rung and they want to move all the way through in this area? What are those levels? What are the skills and experiences that are needed? What are the critical ones that you've got to have and which are the ones that would be nice to have? What's the training and the education that you need to support you? And we re repositioned our whole learning curriculum to sit behind the career paths. Almost all of our learning curriculum now is designed to support each of the career paths. So what are the skills? What's the learning and the, and, uh, that we can give to you and the support? And very importantly, where do you find the jobs? Where do you find the jobs? So um, that's what a career path looks like for us in the culinary and the cooking area. And as I say, it's designed to show if you want to move through the structure and continue to get promoted, this is how you do it. If you want to master your craft, this is how you do it. And if you want to take a number of sideways moves, this is how you can do it. We also trained all of our managers, and we have about 6,000 managers in this business, so that they understood what are the career paths? What do they need to do to support their colleagues? Um, so that as we launched it, we ensured that we had really a wave of commitment and support around this. A couple of other important points, and I think, Edward, this picks up on a few of the items that, that you mentioned. Um, we wanted to demystify what it takes to get on here. The first way that we did that was we made it so easy for frontline people to understand what these things are. And we put it into their hands. And we put it into their hands by, first of all, for those people that love digital, it's all available digital, and we helped with that. And then secondly, for people that hate digital and actually like to have pieces of paper, we sent to 50,000 people to their home addresses, which is something we very rarely do, um, all of the collateral around the career paths so that we could make sure that they understood that this is, this is for them. It's developed by them. It's for them. It's for their progression. And we are here to support and serve them. And then the final thing, and I think this gets to Edward, your comment around confidence. Often when you, we would listen to, to feedback from frontline people, it wasn't always the skills that they were missing. And sometimes it wasn't actually understanding where the jobs were. 
the magic that was missing was confidence. And to support our career paths, we have an ongoing communication campaign that we call hashtag no limits. There are no limits to somebody's career in our business. We showcase, we share, and we celebrate the stories of progression from real people that live real lives in this business. And our message there is, this person looks like you. This person could be you. If they've done it, you can do it. So we are trying to build the confidence as well as the skills of our workforce to say, we believe in you and we think there's no limit to your career. It's been really successful. We're really pleased with where we are. We've had massive take up, but the next step for us is going to be to measure progress in our business, to measure progress. And we're going to measure progress. We're going to start doing that later this calendar year. We're going to cut our organization in three levels, three horizontal levels. And our aspiration is at the top 200, at the middle management, and at the organization below those three levels, we will be fully reflective of society at all of those levels. We're not there yet. We're nowhere near yet. But that's our aspiration from a gender perspective, from a race perspective, and we will be measuring socioeconomic background so that we can understand where are the barriers to people progressing are people progressing from the first rung all the way to the top? If careers are faltering, where does it falter? And then we can understand why and what we need to do differently to support people. But the measurement is critical because it enables us to course correct and ensure that we're making a real and meaningful difference. So that's what we've done at Compass Group. I'm sure there's millions of things that we could learn from all of the organizations um, that are sitting on this call, but that's, that's where we have tried to enable the progression of the brilliant people that work for us. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. It's really, uh, really good to hear what you're doing at Compass. And it's also really good to hear that social mobility is uh, a key part of your strategy and that you are thinking about progression and clear pathways for all your uh, employees. Uh, so thank you very much. And I'm sure uh, Donna would like to take questions later at the end of the Q&A session. Uh, so I'll now hand over to Charlotte from the Department for Work and Pensions, uh, who will tell you about what PWP are doing in their workforce on progression. Great, thank you very much, Edward. Um, so just a quick intro, uh, my name's Charlotte, as you know, I'm the lead social mobility at the DWP and I'm based within the people and capability team. Um, so my role is inward facing largely. I'm looking, I've spent a lot of time looking what we're doing for employees. I am starting now to look outwards in terms of attracting talent. Um, we've got around 96,000 employees at the moment. Um, with a range of grades and hundreds of job roles within the DWP, which gives you the opportunity to start your career in one area, such as HR, and end up in a career uh, like digital. Um, so that diversity and progression is very important to us and um, to open up as many opportunities as possible. So most people are here because there's a desire to improve their organisation's social mobility or socioeconomic diversity and research strongly supports that people from lower backgrounds will perform at least as well and on occasion better from those from other backgrounds. So if we just move on to the next slide. I've got the slide here, thank you. Um, I've just added this really to underpin that helping others to rise and progress doesn't diminish the achievements of yourself. 
but it underpins what we need to do to drive equality. So social economic diversity is truly intersectional. You will possess more than one protected characteristic and what we can do through social mobility is naturally rise other elements of equality as well, which is one of my strap lines to frequently sell um, my strategy to um, those who I need to sell it to. So on to the next slide. So this, um, you'll see a kind of trend now as we go through, Donna talked about it, Edward talked about it, um, and we do have formal progression programmes and I will talk about them, but it has to go further back to start. So progression's brilliant um, and we will talk about that, but where do we start with colleagues? So time after time when engaging with people who come to what I call our network, and by that I mean everybody who is part of the socio um, economic diversity network within the DWP. Um, we had feedback which clearly states they don't have the confidence to put themselves forward or to recognize themselves as talent. So if we have talent programs and I'm mentoring someone, I'll say there's this talent program. Well, I'm not talented. Well, of course you're talented. You just need somebody to tell you that you're talented. And actually I heard a quote the other day. Um, it was from Oti Mabuse, uh, famous dancer if anybody's not a Strictly fan and she said I genuinely think people don't know their potential until someone comes and demands it of you saying I see more I believe in you so building confidence and giving people that wraparound care and direct support is a real key moment I think lots of us think back to that moment in life where someone said that to us so for me it was a line manager for other people it could have been a teacher at school so um, that's building from the ground up. Networking is an area which is um, the Social Mobility Commission have done presentations on it before around the importance of building your network to your own advantage. And, and for some people, this comes naturally. Um, for others, we have to kind of make those links. So find a mentor for someone, find a group of people, invite them into you know, that social mobility support network. And this can really change your opportunity. It can break down barriers, offering to speak to someone about their aspirations. Maybe we do monthly outreach events, making yourself and your job role visible. Um, so here at the DWP, working with a range of government departments, but also with external organisations and charities, you know, the Princess Trust were mentioned, but we work with smaller charities, people referral units um, and other government departments, which help us make those other links. Um, yes, we want to retain talent. Um, but we also want people to find a career path that's best for them. And sometimes that can be somewhere else. So if I can make that link and we can make that link as a network, then that takes them forward as well. Um, applications and interviews are the single biggest thing we always get asked about. Um, and it's kind of links back to confidence, but I spend a huge amount of time just helping people with applications. And what I need to do is, is build a group of people who can do that because it is really time consuming, but really important. Um, I've delivered formal training on this to around about 6,000 people and across government as well. So just explaining and breaking down you know, how you prepare for an interview, how you word things, the language you use, how do you present yourself in an interview? Um, I mean, I'm great at telling other people how to do that, but obviously in that moment when you're being interviewed, uh, it all really comes down to that hour. But if we can do everything to prepare someone, then that really helps. And believing, so linking back to confidence again, we find people talk about self-limiting beliefs, which hinders their own aspirations. So we hold sessions about overcoming that, overcoming imposter syndrome. So I want people to move from the thought of why am I here? Why have I got a place at the table? To why haven't I got a place at the table? Because I've got a valuable opinion and experience and important voice too. So I'm going to move into formal progression units, but I would say ownership and project teams leading on these with a passion for the programme and holistic support. So recognise that it's not just that kind of learning and structure, but that real holistic um, invest in them and invest fully in social mobility and socioeconomic diversity. So moving on to the next slide on terms of and this is just a kind of almost a whistle stop tour. So because the DWP is so big, I don't know everything that's going on in every area. Um, we are based in almost every town in the UK and there'll be lots of people doing lots of things. Um, so the first one that I'm going to talk about is the Aspire programme. So this is a programme within a particular directorate called Service Excellence. And it comprises of six themed workshops 
from an introduction to leadership, self-analysis, networking, personal impact and personal reflection, as well as providing you the opportunity of a peer support group and a mentor. So this covers many of the leadership things, building relationships, network, reflection um, and how to have impact. So I, I say to people and um, my mentees and when I'm training, you can influence without authority. So you can have that sway and you can persuade people. You don't necessarily need to be in the really high grades to do that. You just need to persuade them to have the influence you want them to have. Um, and again, we do preparation for interviews within this. So we did it in 2021 and 95% of people reported that it helped them develop and over 10% secured promotion. Now bear in mind, this was a program with hundreds of people. That's quite a significant number. Um, summer school uh, is one that I hear people talking about a lot with, with quite a lot of passion um, about their time at summer school. So this is a development initiative, initiative tailored to local regions. So um, Donna talked about cold spots. We do have data. So we break down our data by geographical location, grade and directorate. And being able to do that, we can spot different cold spots. So not just um, like we know that Midlands is a cold spot. We know the Northeast Yorkshire and Humber, but we also know we've got work to do in private office and strategic comms. And we also know we've got work to do at grade seven and grade six. Uh, I won't bore you with the grading, but that's in the senior leadership team. And that's just before you get to senior civil servant. So it has that local approach. It's for open to entry level grades into the civil service up to middle management. And the cohort will have a talent alliance director, support from a senior leader and also summer school ambassadors who have done it before. It's quite similar to the Aspire programme and its themes, but it's open to all employees. So it's not directorate specific. Um, it teaches them to problem solve, work collaboratively on projects. And this is outside a lot of the people's normal workplace activities. And it also helps them how they what they can do to align their priorities to DWP's wider priorities, which is a key part when you're looking at progression as well. Um, operational delivery leadership program and ODPLP, because it wouldn't be civil service if we didn't have an acronym is open to those um, who have the potential to become senior leaders in the future. Now, this is a longer three year program and it's aimed at the five grades up to middle management and it's more robust development plan. Um, and it's, it puts the individual into different directorates as well. Lots of different project, projects, lots of different challenges. A lot of people compare this to the fast stream um, in terms of the impact it can have on your progression. Um, so they also work between a level towards a level six diploma in leadership and management. Um, and there's an application process, but there's also support for that application process as well. Uh, future Leaders Academy, again, we're identifying who we think will be future leaders, cross government programme, not just DWP, uh, aimed at the first three grades of civil service who want to become leaders of the future. You work collaboratively across the civil service, so we're building that network again, um, and it helps you understand how you can work on with a wider range of stakeholders. Um, and they have to have a project that identifies an organisational business issue, and this is pitched in a Dragon's Den style to senior civil servant. And I've had three cohorts of people approach me, all working on different elements of the recruitment process. So again, that comes back to that recruitment um, and the importance of people understanding how we recruit and why we recruit the way we do. Uh, Beyond Boundaries is another cross-government one-year programme designed to help participants develop knowledge, skills and network. In 2021, this was aimed at colleagues from black and ethnic minority backgrounds and disabled colleagues within middle management specifically. So we're lifting from middle management through to senior management. Um, it's relaunching for 2022 already um, and it's data based, it's evidence based in terms of who they're going to target for this one as well. So recognising the gaps um, and then using those gaps to lift people. And it helps people understand their own strengths and motivations. Sometimes people might lack direction. They might think, I, I don't quite know where I want my future career to, to go. And you have to spend some time with people so they can see their strengths and they can see their areas of development and see their passion. So it's really aimed at doing that. Um, lots of similar things, you know, professional coaching, personal research, group project work, um, but it hasn't been analysed yet. So I haven't got any outcomes for that yet. Um, Catapult is a cross-government mentoring programme, so this is specifically aimed at mentees from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. 
um, to consider their wider development career opportunities, you will be offered a mentor from another civil service department. They will be grade seven and above, so that's senior leader and above. Now, this has been really effective and it's headed up by the Ministry of Justice. They're the ones that do the matching and all of the work behind this. And each one of us within a department are a single point of contact. So nearly 15,000 civil servants have been mentored on this scheme across 28 government departments. 35% of the last cohort have progressed. 87 would recommend to others. So the impact of having that support and having that mentor is just improved hundreds of people's progression. Um, and finally, a good learning platform, as we've, we've just seen, underpins your organisation as a continuous learning environment, allowing people to dip in and out, understand their skills gap, and civil service learning is shared across the entire civil service. Hundreds and thousands, thousands of courses, not just usual manual handling stuff, lots of other useful courses as well. Um, so on to the summary slide with an eye on the clock. Um, so uh, some final recommendations. Uh, reach out to your local communities. So when we're talking about attracting talent, reach out to your schools, your colleges, your people referral units, you know, don't discount anyone from having that potential just because they haven't necessarily followed that academic path. Um, there will be such a diverse range of talent out there and you can start to provide some light touch support. So if, if we go in, so next week I'm going into a college to do um, mock interviews at a local college in the northeast so that's the kind of light touch now if someone says oh I'm, can i come to you if I've, I've got an interview in the future yes and i will have a pool of people who'll be able to have a conversation with you so it's just that light touch and lifting people um, in their journey as well flexible working locations we've already talked about cold spots make it clear in your application in the blurb when people apply that it's a flexible location it increases the diversity of applicants being able to extend roles nationally um, will really lift that that opportunity for people as well uh, line managers so line managers are the key to anything working in an organization you need line manager buy-in senior manager buy-in in a lot of ways for me is easier because I go, we need to do this. And they go, yes, we do. That's morally right. But then I need to go to line managers and go, I know you've got targets to hit. I know you've got to see a certain number of customers a day, but I need you to have a performance conversation every, every month or every other month with every single one on your team. That's the harder conversation. So getting line management buy-in is essential to any of this working. Um, I mean, I can't, it's hard to it's hard to get and it's a culture change to get to that continuous learning but whatever you invest in it it will pay in dividends coming back so staff networks not to be underestimated so I work really closely with the co-chairs of my social mobility network and really closely with what called champion support as well so they work for my director general champion and we work as like a really solid team um, people will seek support from their peers and that's what our network does. We have um, 10 social mobility ambassadors and they all have protected time to work on projects for us. And that just means it gives them someone to go to. Um, and I would really recommend giving people protected time for this. So um, it just means that we're saying we invest in this and we're showing that we believe this is important by giving you time to work on it. Um, performance discussion, so having a system where you sit with the employee and talk about the good work and achievements, key skills, areas for development, that's where you get the buy-in, that's where you tell them that they're talent, and it gives them a kind of more wraparound support as well. Uh, shadowing work experience, especially in a large organisation like somewhere in DWP, it can be invaluable because it can be a barrier to you formulating those examples for your interview and your application if you have no experience working in digital but want to work in digital so we we're piloting and um, shadowing a work experience and um, new programs this year and personal stories if people can see then they believe that they can do and they believe they can reach their aspirations so we have social mobility champions right at the highest level all the way through and they give personal accounts of their background and their social mobility story we don't all have that story we don't need to have that story anyone is welcome in our network as long as they pay it forward. If you succeed, we expect you as part of our network to turn around and help the next person up as well. So, but people do really value those success stories from people from lower socioeconomic backgrounds as well. There we go, <laughs> finished. I got through that as quick as I could.
Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte. That was, that was really good to hear. And uh, obviously, yes, conscious of the time, so you done really well there. Um, it was really good to also hear um, the piece that both Charlotte and Donna, you both uh, pulled out around confidence building is quite a key factor in this, ensuring that uh, all those within organisations do have that kind of confidence to progress and understand of what, what they want to do and what's available out there. Um, what I'll do now, we have got a few minutes left for uh, uh, questions. So Charlotte and Donna, I'll uh, bring you back in. We have had uh, a few uh, come through. So uh, I'll just have a quick look that uh, for any participants on the line, feel free to uh, put questions in. Um, so I'll just go to uh, some of the questions. Uh, so this one was specifically uh, for Donna, but actually Charlotte, I think you could answer this too. It was, uh, have uh, Donna, have Donna and team uh, developed measures to track uh, progress and success? So it's about tracking of uh, progress and success. And I wonder if you could elaborate if you have. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a really good question. Um, uh, from the careers path, path perspective, I'd say that we feel we're too, it's a bit too soon for us to really um, measure anything other than the really obvious measures at this point, such as how many, what proportion of our workforce have taken, taken up the offer of career paths, what proportion have started it and continued or started it and then dropped out, what's the feed, what's the feedback from people that are doing it, those are just ob really obvious simple measures, they're not outcome driven measures, we're not at that point yet. But what we what we will be moving to is outcome driven measures. So we will measure the not only the proportion of people that take up our career paths, but also as a result of that, the proportion of people that, that then go on and take a promotion within a given time of completing their career path. Um, and in addition, of course, the measure around did they find it helpful, supportive, et cetera, that more qualitative uh, piece of feedback. The important measurement piece for us is that we are going to create a step, step change in measurement in our company and I think on the first slide I shared with you that the, the getting on is, is, is only one piece of a five piece strategy um, and from a measurement perspective what we're going to do is um, we're going to cut our organization into three levels top 200 middle management and then the rest of the organization and we're going to measure gender race which we already do but the step change for us is we're going to measure socio-economic background we're going to be asking the people that work for us to tell us what their socio-economic background is by by asking in particular the question around your parental job at the age of 14 we'll do that when we launch our employee survey and what will that will enable us to start to do in the future is first of all create a baseline of the socio-economic background of our of our colleagues but then understand with that background where and how do they progress do we start to see people faltering are they able to work through the grades in the way that we'd want to so for us measurement is going to be the big strategic unlock moving forward and i, I would say that unless you're measuring it frankly you don't know if anything you're doing is making a blind bit of difference so measurement for me is absolute for us is absolutely critical uh it's really good to hear that as well because uh, so that's what we advocate for data is a key part of the picture uh particularly looking at socioeconomic background because we know uh organizations aren't as developed in their thinking uh they collect data on gender and ethnicity but Social economic background is a bit of a barrier and to hear that your organization is uh, looking at uh, parental occupation as the key uh, the key question is good because that's our key question uh, as well i think we've got time for one more question so i might uh, uh, hand this over to charlotte because she also mentioned uh, something around uh, line managers so it, it, uh, it's just a question. This did come in for Donna, but I think I might hand it to Charlotte. Uh, did uh, did you find any resistance from line managers, given that they have uh, performance standards to reach? And how did uh, you successfully introduce uh, this new culture? 
So Charlotte, I know you mentioned around uh, that some pushback from line managers, so I don't know if you wanted to expand on that. Yeah, so um, we did an all staff survey um, recently and asked people what their barriers to um, investing in development programmes and attending social mobility events were. Um, and it was workload um, and there were line managers was kind of one of the, the top four. Um, but obviously your your workload is impacted by your line manager. Um, the biggest challenge for me is the size of the organization. How do I get to line managers sitting in a job center somewhere in, you know, down in Cornwall? Um, how do I get that message across? So culture change takes years for a start, um, but we also have a bit, quite a diverse workforce anyway. But our most diverse grade is um, first line of management, basically, um, in e called an EO grade. So what I've done is taken that, built it into the strategy for 2022-23, is um, reaching out to line managers. And I've got a um, what we call a steering group. So that is a senior leader from each area of the organisation. So I have asks of them. And one of the asks of them is to help deliver on the strategy and go out to their line managers and do the awareness sessions. But my ambassadors will go to team meetings. I'll go to team meetings. We hold we've held really big events, which have kind of attracted 24,000 people. And we've just delivered that message constantly is um, speculate to accumulate, you know, invest now. It will pay in the future. Um, for everybody to move forward. So it's not easy. I'm, I haven't got a kind of catch-all res response. Culture change, you, 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 do, you are looking at around about five years to really embed that, that view. So um, we're working on it and it's a key part of the strategy for next year, this, this year into next year. Brilliant. Uh, thank you, uh, Charlotte. And uh, fortunately, we have actually run out of time uh, for any uh, more questions. Uh, but I would just like to say thank you for all for uh, attending today's session. Um, so I hope everyone's found it uh, useful and have uh, gained some insights. Um, also, I'd like to thank uh, Donna and Charlotte uh, for sharing uh, some of the work you're undertaking. Um, and I think the key bit here is getting the real world insights uh, from organisations. Um, so we do uh, encourage all employers to look at some of our, our toolkits. Uh, that we have available on our website and reflect on uh, how your organization can uh, review and develop practices to develop uh, uh, support for socioeconomic background and socioeconomic diversity within your organization. Uh, so just to say our next event is uh, scheduled for uh, the 27th of April. So it's a session on uh, how to talk about class in the workplace uh, with guest speakers uh, from Tim Smith who's a partner at BCLP, uh, at, and James uh, Hillhouse, co-founder of Commercial uh, Break. Uh, so we'll be shortly sending out invitations, uh, so do look out for that in your inbox. Uh, and finally, uh, just a, a plug to the uh, Social Mobility Index um, from our partners at the Social Mobility Foundation. Um, so the index is an annual benchmarking tool for best practice in social mobility. Um, so the 2022 uh, index is now open uh, for submissions uh, from all organisations. So it's open to employers of any size, sector and uh, stage of your social mobility journey. So uh, please do check out uh, their website for any further information. Uh, and just to finally say thank you for all uh, for joining today and uh, a special thanks to Donna and Charlotte as well for bringing the, uh, their real world examples in, but thank you.